This week's episode brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel, the exclusive travel agency of Communicore Weekly, unless we're going someplace besides Disney. Actually, who would go anywhere besides Disney? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And here's a new episode. I don't have anything clever to say this time. Really? Yeah, I guess we didn't, you know, we never talk about how we're going to be clever. We just assume it's going to That it's going to happen, yeah. Yeah, like an epiphany. We don't, we, yeah. we can't really pre-plan for cleverness. It just happens. Yeah, it, it, it just happens to us. It's one of our gifts. However, you know. that gift is now absent at this moment in time, in case well, you couldn't tell. This is, I mean, we're hitting in the 70s in our episodes. I mean, it's, it's going to it's gonna run out eventually. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it took a little over a year. It's a fickle finger of fate. That's a lot of alliteration. Hey, I'm, that's, that's what I'm good at. Speaking of alliteration, let's talk about Sleeping Beauty Castle. It's time for Disney History! So George, how would you like to spend a night inside Sleeping Beauty Castle? Is it haunted? Um, it could be. Okay, because ghosts scare me. Well, I mean, there's really no ghosts per se in that movie, so I guess it's not really that haunted. And I guess without breaking some laws, really can't help you sleep in the castle. I mm. I can help you walk through it, though. How, how about that? Ooh, that's pretty close. Like, walk th right through the middle of it like everybody else gets to do? No. No. I'm talking about actually, literally walking through the castle, which you can actually do at Disneyland. And it is pretty awesome. I've, didn't, I've done it a few times. See, when Disneyland first opened, the castle was meant to advertise the yet unreleased movie Sleeping Beauty. And it didn't host any attractions or anything inside of it, it just had a whole lot of empty space. But, empty spaces were kind of like a challenge to Walt. And then Walt said, challenge accepted, why waste all this? So he, he asked his Imagineers to, to fill it with something. Hmm. It's good we don't have a lot of empty space on this show. No, not at all. Yeah, I don't know what we'd fill it with. Well, everybody, you know, despite having to fight off the uh, feral cats, which might be another podcast episode altogether, because uh, there were a bunch of them inside the castle. Uh, Imagineers opened up a brand new walkthrough attraction in April of 1957. And for the first 20 years, the story of Sleeping Beauty was told through dioramas using a style similar to that of Evan Earl. And Earl was the production designer of the 1959 film and was heavily involved with the creation of the walkthrough as well. His wonderful style helped to tell the story for years until it was redesigned in 1977. Now, the new dioramas were, had a lot more movement and depth to them, and they were really highly detailed. Um, the downside is that they looked more like the Main Street Emporium windows displays than anything else, and I know you guys have seen some of them before, and some of them are kind of freaky. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, there's that. But Earl's style was still, it was considered out of date by the late, the late 1970s when they changed it. So uh, it was out with the old and in with the new ones, even though they were freaky. So the walkthrough actually stayed this way until October of 2001, when due to low attendance, the walkthrough was closed for refurbishment. However, over time, the Sleeping Beauty walkthrough was quietly removed from the refurb list. Not that that's ever happened before with any other Disney attraction. Not at all. Ever. Uh, in fact, the sign over the entryway uh, disappeared, and it was all but swept under the rug. Or under the drawbridge, I guess. One of the two. Maybe One swept the two. into the dungeon? Ooh, that would be good. The yeah. fungeon. The fungeon. The fungeon. Pulling a little wreck at Ralph. So, anyway, so there was no official closing announcement, and no one made 
any mention of why it was closed. There are a few theories as to why, such as security concerns after 9-11, low attendance, of course, because not many people knew about it, and uh, m the most likely candidate, of course, was accessibility. Though it predated the 1990 law to make attractions accessible, Disney always strived to make sure all of their guests enjoyed every attraction. So in 2008, Disney finally announced that the walkthrough would return by the end of the year. And <clears throat> according to the press release at the time, the show will differ through the dioramas of the 1980s and 90s, returning to the unique style of the 1957 show in motion picture. Enhanced with new scenes and special, ma uh, special effects magic, the reimagined attraction will employ technology not available in the 1950s, except through time travel, to represent the scenes from the story of Sleeping Beauty. And they also included the magic of the good fairies, flora, fauna, and Meriwether, and the more sinister spells of the evil Maleficent. Where? No, no, oh, not, oh. not for real. Just oh. in, in the walkthrough. Yeah, I've been reading the Kingdom Keepers, which he scares me, so... Anyway, De Disney definitely did the right thing here, and they combined the beloved original attraction that they had with the technology of today to make something really special. Uh, in addition, because of all the stairs and difficult passageways to navigate, Disney made the accessible or the walkthrough accessible by providing a virtual walkthrough of it in a ground floor room of the castle. Now, after being closed for seven years and the original gone for almost three decades, this new version opened to rave reviews, and it continues to entertain guests even to this day. And of course, this attraction is only available at Disneyland. There is another walkthrough at s attraction at Sleeping Beauty Castle in Disneyland Paris, but that's its own history segment in its all own right. Yeah, because I, I saw the one before the redo, and, you know, back in the 90s, and it was kind of weird. Kind of funky. Yeah, this it's one is good. really, really cool though. I like all yeah. the special effects, and uh, there's even a part where it scares me every single time because wow. I always forget that it's going to happen there. But you know, if I knew somebody that lived in California that could, you know, give me a free place to stay. If only you there. knew anyone that huh. lived in California. It's, huh. a, it's a shame you don't, though. Yeah, it is a shame. Sorry. He's a nerd, he's a geek, he's a geek. but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah! It's George's Book of the Week. So this week's book is called Wally Bogue, Clown Prince of Disneyland by Wally Bogue and Gene Sands, published in 2009, and it clocks in at 176 pages. This book is more than a biography. I'd consider this book a workography uh, of the career of the amazing Wally Bogue. Uh, Wally performed at the Golden Horseshoe Review at Disneyland for a remarkable 27 years. And he even debuted at Disneyland on opening day, July 17, 1955. And prior to that, he spent 15 years traveling the world performing for the King and Queen of England, on the Ed Sullivan Show, and at clubs on many different continents. And by his own right, Wally was a star before he joined the Golden Horseshoe Review. Uh, in his book, he depicts a time in the world where performers spent most of their time on the road and rarely settled down. Uh, thank goodness his two-week contract at Disneyland lasted for more than 27 years. That's a long two weeks. That's a long two weeks. Hope he got paid for some of it. But uh, you do get a good idea of how much work went into the life of a comedic artist that also incorporated dancing, singing, and making balloon animals. So Clown Prince chronicles Wally's life from his birth in 1920 to the publication of the book. And along the way, we meet family members, cherished performers, friends, Walt Disney, and other important people in Wally's life. And the book is more than a memoir. It's a scrapbook of a very, very talented artist. Uh, with an average of two photos per page, I'd guess that there are over 200 photos altogether. Uh, that include family and performance photographs, clippings, and letters that attest to his astounding career. Um, in addition to the 27 years at Disneyland, he spent a few years at Walt Disney World and Tokyo Disneyland. And he was there during the time when all Walt wanted was to make Disneyland the best it could be. And cast members were given a freer reign and allowed to develop ideas for new shows and skits. And one of uh, my favorite tales from the book, Wally recounts the creation of the gunfights in Frontierland. Uh, he approached the frontier lawman Marshall Lucky about staging gunfights, and this is a quote from the book. I would call him out, throw a couple of insults at him, and we would pace off and draw. He, of course, would win. I'd do a dramatic fall and roll over. The people loved it. So did Walt. 
He saw us do it one day and said, that's great. Do it whenever you feel like it. So I enlarged our plot by getting up on the roof of the horseshoe so he could shoot me off of it. We even did some shootouts on the railroad circling the Disneyland park. It was fun doing it, but one day a young man with a clipboard came to see me at my dressing room and informed me that I was scheduled to do gunfights at 1, 3, and 5. Uh, I told him that it was becoming too much for me to do in addition to my five shows a day at the horseshoe. Instead, I thought it would be a good idea for, to let them hire some professional bad guys. He took my advice, and the gunfights became a regular part of the entertainment in Frontierland. So I can't imagine a gunfight on the train around Disney. See, there was no way they would let them do that from the roof of the building now and have him fall no, off. It's just not at all. too many laws. Too many yeah, laws. So, so it was a very different time. And, and Wally paints a very intimate picture of working at the Golden Horseshoe and recounts a story that you won't hear anywhere else. Uh, in addition, uh, Wally can still be heard today as the voice of Jose at the Enchanted Tiki Room and as the voice of the Toucan, uh, voice in the Toucan and the Parrot Show, the electronic utility show, on the Walt Disney and the 1964 World's Fair CD set. Uh, he also helped create the dialogue for both shows. And if you want to see something absolutely amazing, check out Walt Disney Treasures. The, the Disneyland Secret Stories and Magic DVD because they're the TV special for the Golden Horseshoe was on there. And it's and you awesome. Get see, you get to see Wally Bogan his finest and this book sort of just gives you an overview of his whole career. But if you get the opportunity, check out that DVD. And this book is called Wally Bogue, The Clown Prince of Disneyland. Yum, 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 yum. If you want to get to know your food, you gotta have a food report. So uh, a few months ago, Jeff and I had the opportunity to do a Walt Disney World research trip, which we've talked about before, so we won't we won't belabor the point anymore. We but went on we, a research trip, guys. Yes, we did. It was so much fun. It was awesome. Um, and we found a hidden Oswald. But that's not what this is about. This is about food in a restaurant. But we had the opportunity to enjoy Goofy's Beach Club breakfast um, over you know the, at the Cape May Cafe, and it was absolutely astounding. Uh, an all-you-can-eat buffet... Uh, mini Goofy Donald and Beach Attire and all the food at the buffet that you could want. And, and I wanted a lot for some yeah. reason that morning. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of bacon that day. You know, it's weird because I'm usually not a big breakfast person. Maybe like something small like a bagel. But whenever I go to a buffet for breakfast, I feel like I need to get everything possible that mm -hmm. I can. So I usually go a little overboard. Yeah, and I went overboard, but it was all so good. Oh, that's what we do. Um, it, it's as we mentioned, it's a buffet, so they've got all. It's your traditional, you know, walk up and I spy what you want to eat and grab some of it, and see somebody else's plate and well, where was that? How do I get some of that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was food, a lot of that going around. Food was well done. I mean, they had scrambled eggs, sausage, bacon, breakfast potatoes, which is awesome, and breakfast pizza. Yeah, hello. I'm on the, board with that. Yeah, breakfast pizza is fantastic. Um, and, and tons of different bakery rolls and, and yogurty stuff. They, and they had Mickey waffles. They did have Mickey waffles. That's right. That's right. And fortunately, the party we were with didn't mind when we cut them up and made little scary mouse noises as we ate them. But That's okay. I think they expected it from us. They probably at, expected at it after at the end of a week. You so. know, it's, it's funny because I, I went to the Cape May Cafe um, the trip before that trip um, during the Epcot 30th weekend with mm -hmm. uh, some of the guys from Fanboys and Kingdom Cast and we went for dinner ah. and I wasn't nearly as impressed. I mean, most of them, they ate their weight uh, in crab legs <laughs> but I'm not a big seafood person but the other stuff they had there for dinner I wasn't overly impressed with but the breakfast I thought was fantastic and I think I even had more fun with the characters coming over to us every five minutes oh. and uh, you know being that jerks was fantastic. with us I mean that's you know with us allowing us to be and then playing along yes you know it's we've done um, you know this this was a good character meal I thought but but my biggest problem with the character meal is you know, you're eating, you've got your eyes out, you're looking to see when the characters couldn't have come around so you don't miss them. You don't want them to skip you, which of course they're not going to do. They're professionals now. Yeah. Okay. They're going to see every table. But then when they get close, you get kind of nervous. You're like, okay, do I eat some more? Do I wait? How long do we have to wait? Do I have Are to you? offer them some? <laughs> Would you? Does Goofy, I mean, does, does Pluto want me to like throw a sausage on the floor so he can have it? Like we'll what, it what's it. the etiquette? But they, yeah, they, they come up and, you know, do what they always do. Take some photos. Let you take three or four photos and 
and then move on. So it's, it's always great. You know, we should do a tip segment, you know, talk to the people at the next table and ask them if they'll take a photo or two for you and then reciprocate. Yeah, make friends. That's so always a good they are thing. in there. And yeah, then I, they can watch your kids, Ooh. you know, maybe borrow a hundred bucks from them, you know, whatever. That's friends, pretty good. Friends do that kind of thing. This tip got even better. So, but, but when we were there, you know, Donald by far was awesome. Yeah, I think we had the most yeah. fun. We had the most Donald. fun with Donald. He he made us do poses with him, and uh, shook his 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 tail th- feathers. His tail feathers. Thank you. There you go. Family friendly show here, um, like like the Ray Charles song, shake <laughs> shake your fel- tail feather. <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, and it's in a good location. So after you're done, you could, you know, take one of the friendships to Epcot, or you can or, walk to walk up walk. off that food that you yeah. just overgorged yourself with because you're sort of in between um at the beach club you're sort of in between the epcot and the disney hollywood studios so you can choose one of those or you know or go wherever you want go wherever you want to but it was i thought it was a great deal i mean right now it's like 26 to 30 dollars for an adult and kids are like 13 to 17 and chances are i don't know if your kid if they're that little they're going to eat that much but you're really paying for that great character experience I think it's definitely one of the better character breakfasts that they have at Walt Disney World. Um, mm-hmm. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, but it was nice because people weren't flailing their napkins around and throwing food everywhere inadvertently when they, at some other character breakfast that isn't a big A-frame hotel. Well, anyways, I've given too much information. I don't know what you're talking so, about. I refuse I don't to know acknowledge either. that. And Good. That we won't is talk that. about it. We won't talk about it. But yeah, I felt like I got my, my, my fill. I never felt like I was rushed to get out of there. You know, we were there probably about 45 minutes, close to an hour. Got to see, you know, Goofy was there. Donald was there. I think we we saw Minnie. Did we, we did see, see Minnie. Did we see Daisy? I don't remember if we saw Daisy. I want to say we only saw one duck. Yeah, I think we only did see one duck. But that's okay. Donald was awesome. And we're a huge fan. Don't tell Mickey we said that. Yes. Three yeah. caviar for the win. Oh, that's good. So that's go eat at the Cape May Cafe. It is yep. delicious. We enjoyed it. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. <laughs> Just as you enter the show building for Star Tours at Disney Hollywood Studios, you'll see a few white circles off to the right-hand side. Now, in the middle of one of them, in red lettering, you'll see N1C7C01. Now, if you read every other letter in a row, you'll wind up with NCC-1701, which is the designation of Star Trek's Starship Enterprise. Now, now, isn't that like sacrilege? Um, not anymore since J.J. Abrams oh, is directing both of them. So that's true. That's totally true. works. That'll be like the tenth Star Wars movie. Will be a mashup of Star Wars and Star Trek, and we'll I be would, all confused. I I would pay to see that. Now, if you could bring Indy in there as well. I like where this is going. Yeah, we could have some fun with this. This is armchair movie Ooh, near. We don't want to do that because oh, yeah. then they'll never be able to use then any they'll of They'll never do it. Well, well, okay, then disregard we'll just, all then, that. Yeah, don't pay any attention. But we would like to say thank you so much for watching, listening, and absorbing. Be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes. Yep, multiple times, please. Not that that's cheating. No. Not no, it's fair so, game. It's, it's fair definitely game. fair game. Fair game. Podcasts and war or something i guess in war and hand grenades i don't know something like that so uh, email us anytime at communicorweekly at gmail.com funny stories bathroom photos well never mind you you know the bathroom photos we like exactly you can also like us on the facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly yep and always follow us on twitter i'm at imagine nerding and he's at jeff heimbuck and for jeff heimbuck I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Ibuck. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Hot now. <laughs> <laughs>